first, I'm sorry, I should introduce the first speaker of the day, my friend Marianne Hoising from NIH, who, by the way, today went up to someone completely different and thought that, that I was them. Come here. I, I, <laughs> we've been working together for three years now, and, uh, and it's lovely, but she went up to someone. Uh, where, where are you, Nancy? The other Nancy, stand up. Apparently, Nancy from Lediant is my doppelganger, okay? So when you got, she went up to Nancy and was talking to her for a few minutes and said, why don't you have an English accent? <laughs> uh, so anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce Mary Jan Hoising from NIH, whom I adore, and she will give you information about uh, what's going on with Manic. Thank you. Please give her a warm applause. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I, I look forward to this exciting day. I always look forward to coming to an NDF meeting and uh, connecting with the, with the patients and try to explain some of, of the research findings and some of the, um, the, the underlying causes of, of your disease. Um, so my name is Marianne Huising, and uh, I work at NIH for um, about 20 years. And for the last about 18 years, I have been involved first in the g and &E gene, the enzyme, the protein, the sialic acid pathway. Then when the gene was linked to g &E, causing g and &E myopathy uh, in 2001, I've been actively working on the disease and the possible therapy. So I'm the scientist behind um, some of the, the therapies and the pathology of your disease. Um, so I'd like to start with like about three introductionary slides before I get onto why, what we found so far as effects of MANAC and GNE myopathy. Um, so as, as most of you know, but I'm gonna go quickly over the pathway and, and the pathology. GNE myopathy is an autosomal recessive disease which means that both your parents are a carrier uh, and unaffected, and, they, uh, and you inherit their uh, defective chromosome or DNA is on uh, from, from both parents. Um, the estimated prevalence of the disease is about six in a million, and we can get back to that at a later point, uh, not in my talk, because there's no time at this point, but maybe later on in the meeting, and I think Tara is going to address it tonight. Um, so the, causes, uh, the cause of GNE is linked to um, mutation in the GNE gene. It, do we have a pointer? Or do we? Oh. Um, so the GNE gene uh, acts in the sialic acid synthesis pathway, which occurs inside the cell. Sialic acid synthesis pathway basically starts with glucose in the cell, as you see uh, on the top uh, in, in the cell there. That's converted in different steps, and glucose can go in a lot of different pathways, into this sugar-like compound, UDP glucnec. Then the GNE gene, or DNA protein, recognizes UDP glucnec, sticks to it, converts it to MANAC, and immediately to MANAC-6-phosphate. It's done by one gene. GNE does two steps in this pathway. And then two other enzymes further convert it to, to sialic acid. That's new 5 ac um, The sialic acid becomes so-called activated to become CMP sialic acid, which is used in the so-called Golgi pro uh, complex, which creates proteins in your cells, uh, to put sialic acid as the end group of some uh, structure sticking out of the proteins in, um, yeah, stick sialic acid as the end groups. And these proteins were, with sialic acid on it mostly are membrane proteins. So they move to the membrane, as you see on the, the top right of the screen, and, and the sialic acid groups stick out to the outside. So that is where they can signal to other cells. I'll get back to that at, at the next slide. Um, so, the, de the defect in GNE, those two steps around MANAC, um, in patients with GNE myopathy is mild. 
all of you have at least one so-called missense mutation. That, that's only one little nucleotide change that causes one amino acid change in the protein. You do not have a completely null, not functioning g and &E. It is somewhat functioning. So you can make sialic acid, but, but possibly not enough. So you cannot put enough sialic acids on certain like, uh, proteins. That is one of the hypotheses of why, um, uh, why g and &E myopathy may occur. It's a hyposialation, not enough sialic acid. However, the exact disease mechanism is not known. So there are likely other factors that contribute to disease because there's many unknowns that I get to at a different slide. And that is why, for example, your cells are very important to do research not on your body but on your cells so we can do some more sophisticated techniques to see if there are other components contributing to, to disease. Uh, to do a whole genome analysis to see if there's other genes than g and &E that are contributing to the, why is it a muscle disease only? Why is the progression in some patients faster than others? There are other factors that contribute to this disease. Uh, but because g and &E is in this pathway and because hypocyalation plays a role, there are very exciting prospects for very easy therapies, like manic and sialic acid, and I get to that later. Um, so um, there were some recent changes in GNE myopathy that may have been confusing to, to patients and, and possibly scientists as well. Um, there was a recent name change. So the disease GNE myopathy was uh, recognized in several different countries or continents and was named different in, in different places. It, it, um, it was called hereditary inclusion body myopathy, HIBM, mostly by the, the patient population in the United States, DMRV in Japan, uh, IBM2, quadriceps bearing IBM, nonaka distal, distal myopathy. And this became confusing to, to patients, to scientists. So we, uh, in, in a meeting organized by, partly by NDF in 2014, we decided to rename the disease GNE myopathy. It is clear it's associated with GNE, and it would be the, 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 the name covering all previous diseases to make it uh, easier uh, to recruit patients for trials, to, to increase awareness of the disease, and to, to, to not get too much confusion uh, about the name of the disease. Also, which is a little more complex, the mutation nomenclature has changed also since 2014 um, because a, a different sub isoform of GNE was identified. So GNE has two major proteins, and one, the, the newly identified protein was 31 amino acids longer, and it in the front. So all the mutations that were previously reported were. 31 amino acids less reported. So you may have a diagnosis of an M712T mutation, which is the Persian mutation, which is now called M743T. So if you were diagnosed genetically before 2014, your genetic reports show a different uh, mutation nomenclature than if you would get that same mutation diagnosed today. So we researchers know it, um, now most diagnostic laboratories know this as well. The genetic reports before 2014 did not show which isoform was used of GNE because there was only one at that point. So, um, so, so both the, the, the name change and the uh, mutation nomenclature change came um, because scientists across the world were put together in one room, facilitated by NDF. And this is how, how one example of how important meetings such as today are for the field. So there are several challenges in GNE myopathy still after um, you know, being discovered, or the gene being discovered 17 years ago. Um, the diagnosis is still a problem. Many patients have a delayed diagnosis, uh, an average of about 10 years, and the, the disease is still uh, grossly underdiagnosed. Um, that can 
be improved, and it will be improved with current whole genome or whole exome sequencing um, technologies, but it's something that's, that perhaps uh, a patient organization like NDF can, can, can assist in uh, to improve. The, myo the pathology of the disease is still very difficult to explain. Why the adult onset? Why are only skeletal muscles affected? Why is there relative quadriceps sparing? Uh, Silic acid deficiency is involved, but is it, is it the only cause of the disease? Um, what are the other mechanisms that are proposed to, outside of the salic acid pathway that contribute to the disease? And, and GNE myopathy biomarkers, that, that is a compound that is easily um, screenable, like in your blood, um, it's still difficult to identify biomarkers that can be used for diagnosis, for pathology, or for response to therapies. So that is why it is very important to continue the basic research for this disease and to fund basic research for this disease. Okay, now I get to the, the therapies. Um, so hypocyalation is involved in the, in the disease and that is why we decided to treat the hypocyalation first in mouse models and, and later in, uh, in patients um, to see if it would improve the, the clinical symptoms. Uh, so I, I was saying this, this inside the cell proteins get sialylated. These proteins move to the, to the membrane like you see on the left, uh, the left picture on the right top. And then on the right top picture you see what this looks like. It's the cell membrane, these sugars, the sugar groups on proteins are sticking out, kept off by a red sialic acid group. These sialic acid groups signal to other cells, and you can, you can uh, imagine they're negatively charged, and, and that is how they signal, and that is how the proteins move around and do cell cells, um, you know, like in a muscle cell, you, in a muscle, for example, there's a lot of interaction with contractions and relaxations of your muscles. So this is, um, this is also mediated by sialic acid groups. Um, so we tried to find a method that we, uh, to detect these sialic acid groups on membranes, and especially on muscle membranes. And uh, there are compounds that are called lectins, actually that's maybe there, oh, uh, that are called lectins that bind to the end groups on these, these glycans, these sugar structures on proteins. And uh, one of these lectins is called SNA, and that binds to sialic acid end groups. And we put a fluorescent label on this lectin to see in muscle biopsies of patients and controls, how much sialic acid is there. And there exists another lectin that is called VVA that binds only if sialic acid is off. So there's another way to see that you have decreased sialation by increased VVA binding. So this is an example on the left uh, bottom uh, of control Sam, a control muscle SNA staining. You see these bright plasma membranes, very green, highly sialylated, highly bound by this SNA lectin. And on the right, you see a patient muscle imaged, the same microscope settings, stained the same way as the control muscle, and you see that there's significant less SNA staining, so less sialylation. So this is a proof, really, that skeletal muscle in GNE myopathy is hyposialylated. Um, so what could be therapies to increase the sialation? So one therapy is sialic acid therapy uh, in the red block on the bottom. Um, sialic acid is a negatively charged sugar. If you would take it orally, it's very difficult to, to have it taken up by cells. So you would need to find another formulation like extended release to get it more efficiently taken up by cells. Uh, but it, it's, it is uh, a possible therapeutic. Another possibility is sialylated glycoproteins, like IVIG, immune, um, 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 intravenous immune globulins, or sialyl lactose. They are highly sialylated proteins that are broken down in the cell, if you give, give them to, for example, mice, and these... Um, these, the sialic acid groups on there can be reused to sialylate your, your muscle proteins. Uh, this is 
successfully done in mice, but it's not further really, pursu really pursued in patients. And then gene therapy will be uh, a fantastic therapy once, once a lot of research and safety issues have been addressed. So in the meantime, we would like to focus on MANAC. And we would like to use the MANAC trial first to show that increasing sialylation can help the clinical symptoms of, of GNE myopathy, but also develop good outcome methods, good outcome parameters for subsequent trials, like for example, a gene therapy trial, or for example, a, a, a glycoprotein trial, or for any other trial, we develop the, the, the primary outcomes that FDA <laughs> likes and, and approves. And, uh, so I think we, we, we do a lot of legwork for any subsequent trial uh, being conducted on this disease. So why, uh, oh, uh, first I, I need to say, uh, so GNE myopathy can be caused by the step before MANEC that converts udp gluconeck to MANEC, that's called the epimerase enzyme. So it makes sense that if you give MANEC, um, when you have an epimerase deficiency, that you can increase sialic acid. Now the next step from MANEC to MANEC 6-phosphate um, is uh, mediated by the kinase domain of GNE. Now you're thinking like, why if, if I have a kinase mutation, why can I ever, how can I ever make sialic acid? Because the next step is blocked. Uh, so there's this other um, uh, pro, uh, enzyme that is called gluconeck kinase that can actually convert MANEC to MANEC 6-phosphate. So if you have a kinase mutation, which is well documented in this paper in, in blue, um, you, can, you can actually form sialic acid just as efficiently as uh, a, a normal individual if, if you have a kinase, by, by, by gluconeck kinase mediating this, this reaction. Uh, why MANEC? So wh why did we choose to pursue MANEC? So MANEC is the only uncharged sugar in this pathway, monosaccharide. Um, it's, it's the only sugar in this pathway that is taken up by cells, most likely by just diffusion, because it's neutral, uncharged sugar. That is how glucose, well, that could be, trans, it could be a transporter, but it's more efficiently taken up than, than a negatively charged sugar like sialic acid. Um, it is very commonly used historically and currently in cell cultures to make sure that, your, that the cells in culture are fully sialylated. Many pharmaceutical companies add MANEC to the culture medium to make sure that whatever they are producing is fully sialylated. So MANEC is, is a very common compound for this. Um, MANEC has been shown to be therapeutic in mouse models. I'll get to that uh, in the next slide. Um, and now there are mouse or rat models of other diseases, not GNE myopathy, where some hyposialylation is indicated. They're being fed with MANEC, and MANEC does increase their sialylation as well. Um, we've shown that MANEC is safe in mice up to very high doses, um, and it, MANEC can be given orally. So it's very easy to just stop if you have a problem, or it's very easy to take more if you think you... You, you, or you, you want to eat more, more increased salic acid. It's very easy to modulate dosing if it's taken orally rather than an extended release or an injection or a gene therapy, which is forever. Um, so now I get to the main topics, eff effects of MANEC and GNE myopathy. So um, we and others have shown that MANEC um, is therapeutic in mouse models, GNE myopathy, in particular two different mouse models, one with the Persian mutation and one with the, the Japanese uh, most common mutation. Um, so here, is an, here are some images of the two stainings that I was just explaining, SNA and VVA, in uh, control mice. In the left top, you see SNA staining in control mouse muscle, fully sialylated, very green. In the minus minus is a mutant mouse, you see it's decreased, as similar as in patients. And if these mice, were t when they were 12 weeks on MANAC therapy, on the right, you see that their muscle cells fully sialylate again. Uh, and we can show the same effect with the VVA staining on the, on the left bottom, 
controls have hardly any VVA staining, as expected because their muscles are fully sialylated. Mutant mice have increased VVA staining and after therapy that decreases again, indicating resialylation of muscle tissue after manic therapy. Um, the same was shown by uh, Dr. Nishino's group um, in a mouse model uh, with a Japanese mutation, uh, which mimicked the human disease um, very well. Um, when these mice were uh, treated with manic um, for about 10 months, the treatment group had uh, improved muscle contraction and increased motor performance and many other uh, muscle uh, strength um, parameters were measured and they were all increased in, in treated mice compared to untreated mice. So these mouse models were published in 2007 and 2009. And, and Manek was, was shown to be a, a good candidate, so we uh, decided to, uh, to see if we could bring this, this to humans, so clinical studies. In the NIH uh, um, Clinical Center, we started a, um, a natural history study about g and &E myopathy, because if we would ever start a treatment trial, we would need to know what we want to treat and what uh, parameter would be the easiest parameter to show an effect. And this would have to be a parameter of muscle strength or muscle volume or, or a patient's reported outcome. It, it would have to be a clinically significant outcome. Uh, you know, the FDA would not approve a trial on a biochemical outcome like, see, we increase muscle dilation. It needs to, you need to show what gets better in the patient. Uh, so for that, and there was not much known about GE myopathy. So that is why we started the natural history study, and, and uh, several um, uh, parameters have come out of that. Um, in 2012, we started, uh, and the natural history study is ongoing, and there are about 53 patients in it, and it started in 2011. So we have a 53 of, of a large amount of patients, longitudinal data over many years, so we can also measure the decline, we can measure the decline in each individual. Um, phase one study for safety and efficacy, uh, tolerability and pharmacokinetics was performed in 2012, 2013. Um, phase two trial was uh, just finalized last year and we just had the kickoff meeting for a multicenter pivotal trial yesterday. Uh, to start um, our next trial to show efficacy as the FDA would like to, to see it. Uh, so very quickly about our phase one study, uh, which this was a first in human study, so that is why we could only give a single dose of manic to patients and start at a very safe low dose. Um, so patients were divided in three cohorts. Uh, each cohort caught, uh, caught three grams or six grams or 10 grams of Manac, two placebos per cohort. Uh, we had to um, develop a validated method for Manac and sialic acid in plasma, which, which, is, um, which, which we have done through a CRO. If, if any follow-up study wants to use this CRO to do Manac or sialic acid validated assays, we can help you and give you the information for this. Uh, so you don't have to reinvent this yourself. Um, the results of the phase one were that Manek was safe, well tolerated, except for the higher doses, especially the 10 grams. There were some GI problems. I'll get to that later. No serious adverse events. PK favors twice daily dosing. I'll get to that. And uh, the sialic acid synthesis pathway seemed restored. I'll get to that. So the PK, pharmacokinetics, that is how your body handles manic, measured in your blood um, of manic, a single dose. So uh, the placebo was um, mannitol, which is uh, the bottom straight line, the patients that, that got placebo. They did not show any change in their manic concentration, indicating that this is a good placebo. It does not affect any manic, uh, any pathway. Uh, any, anything in the pathway. And then patients with uh, the, the bottom peak, three, six, and 10 grams um, are, are shown. Um, Manic peaked in blood, uh, only uh, uh, 
very fast. Two hours after taking a single dose of Menac, Menac levels peak in your blood, and they're out 12 hours after taking a single dose. So Menac has a very short half-life in your body. But we're not really interested in what Menac does. We're interested in how much sialic acid is produced. And here are the sialic acid curves at the same time points in, in patients' blood. So the bottom line is the, the mannitol placebo. You see that uh, mannitol does not affect amounts of sialic acid either, so it's a good placebo. Uh, the, the bottom um, line is the three gram group, then the 10 gram group, then the six gram group. So you see that sialic, after taking a single dose of Manic, sialic acid peaks in blood 10 hours after. It's, it's, it's a long time, so it slowly increases. 10 hours after, sialic acid peaks, and if you take six or 10 grams of, of Manic as a single dose, it's still high. 48 hours after taking a single dose of Manic, you're still producing extra sialic acid, indicating that Manic is a perfect, slow-release sialic acid. Um, um, compound. So here are the two PK graphs overlaid on the left in gray, uh, Manac, and on the right in blue, sialic acid. Um, so on the right, we're giving uh, Manac. We increase sial sialic acid production, shown by the, the, the peaks in, in plasma. Uh, even in patients with two kinase mutations. So in the phase one trial, we had patients with two epimerase, epimerase kinase, or two kinase mutations. All patients handled sialic, uh, manic into sialic acid production in a similar way. There were no subgroups of where your mutation was. So, yeah. Uh, so based on these results, we designed a phase two trial. Since Manic is out of your blood in 12 hours, we um, decided to, to dose Manic twice daily. Because after 12 hours, it's out, and you take your new dose. Your sialic acid increases steadily. Uh, but as you see in the blue curves, it, it doesn't matter if you take 6 grams or 10 grams of Manic. The, the threshold is the same. There is a... A, a threshold level that your body establishes, and it's not, salic acid levels are not rising above it. So you can constantly give Manic, and the Manic PK would look like the left top, this is a model of, of it, and your sialic acid production will slowly increase, but then levels off, because your body has some kind of protection mechanism to, to keep it at, a, at, at one level. And indeed, this so on the left was the modeling, and on the right is, is the results of our phase two trial where patients received Manex um, twice daily, six grams. Um, so a little bit more about the phase two trial. It was an open label trial, that means no placebo. All patients received Manex, single center uh, at NIH, 12 subjects. Um, all subjects were previously part of the natural history study, so we had strength data and other data on, on these individuals. Um, uh, patients received six grams twice daily uh, for, th for 30 months. Uh, many assessments were done in strength, plasma uh, for, for markers. Muscle biopsies were taken at baseline at day 90. Um, and the objectives of this trial was so in a, in a small controlled group to, uh, to identify, um, long, to show long-term safety, tolerability, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, like efficacy, and a biochemical effect. Um, and a secondary parameter would, uh, would be to try to find a clinical parameter to show efficacy for a, a follow-up phase three trial. Um, so we, we found uh, for, for safety and tolerability, there were no serious adverse effects. However, some patients, about half, half of the patients, showed grade one and grade two, that is mild, uh, GI effects, adverse events. Um, the tolerability at six grams twice daily was uh, difficult for some patients. Um, and, and the adverse events that occurred were all likely related to unabsorbed manic in the GI tract. So that is why we decided to try to, uh, to, to go lower in concentration. 
So we, so we in in a follow-up trial. So we are now um, uh, going to dose four grams, which is much more tolerable, three times daily. Um, and uh, so we initially did that to increase tolerability. And all patients at the 30-month visit went on three times daily dosing, and we got the PK for this. And when we did the modeling for how much sialic acid is formed after you do where the steady state occurs, after you dose three times daily, daily manic, we also sh found that actually three times daily dosing increases the absorption of manic and increases the, the so-called bioavailability of manic. So it, it was a good choice. I'll skip this slide because it may be too technical. Um, I can get back to whoever is interested. Um, so clinical studies, we showed that MANEC is uh, safe and well tolerated at controlled doses in humans in our phase one and phase two trial. Um, that oral MANEC increases plasma sialic acid. Uh, the dosing is adjustable. Um, and we assume we restore the sialic acid pathway because we see increased free sialic acid in blood. However, does MANEC really go inside the cell? We think it does because that is where the pathway is and we, we increase sialic acid. But we also um, uh, took white blood cells, so that is a cell model, easy accessible from patients, and we tested inside white blood cells if, if MANEC sialic acid and CMP sialic, sialic acid were increased. Another proof that MANEC actually goes inside the cell. So to our surprise, we did not find any manic in white blood cells. So it, it looks like the moment it's taken up by the cell, it's processed. We did not see anything, not even like an hour or one and a half hours taken after dosing. We, we do not see any manic inside the cell, but we do see increased sialic acid on the left and increased CMP sialic acid on the right. Uh, it's maybe a little difficult to read without a pointer. The, uh, the bars on the left is pre-dose, and then the second bar is at six hour, after six hours of, of uh, dosing, 12 hours, and then at day 85. And after day 85, patients were taken off manic for a few days. Uh, 48 hours after taking off dosing, the, the, the levels decrease a little bit. So it really shows that manic does increase the intracellular pathway. Uh, but then, really, what we want to treat is muscle cells, right? So now what happens in muscle cells? So we took uh, muscle biopsies at baseline at day 90. We treated them with the lectins, VVA and SNA. Um, the biopsies were taken MRI-guided, uh, which uh, gives a, has a much higher level of success to get uh, very good cells, because if a muscle biopsy is taken um, in a g and &E myopathy patient that you may get, um, not MRI guided, you may get uh, debris or you may get a, a piece of muscle that, is, um, that doesn't have as many healthy cells as, as other muscles may have. Um, so, we, uh, so we did the lectin staining and we did see a difference between baseline and day 90, but you know, it was done by us. So we, we knew we had to quantify this. We knew we had to include an independent researcher to, to do this blinded because we are the, the people conducting the study. So um, um, we worked with a company to develop a quantitation method of fluorescence in muscle cells uh, so that an independent researcher could, uh, um, could, um, evaluate the lectin staining, blind it in patient samples before and after therapy. Um, oh, and first, we, um, we tested this system, this system uh, on a group of control muscle and a group of GNE myopathy muscle untreated. And we found that the, patient, that the control group, um, actually the patient group, had 50% decreased sialation compared to the control group, again indicating are, are really demonstrating that patients with GNE myopathy have decreased sialation. Uh, and then we took that to the phase two trial and we showed in patients um, muscles taken at baseline 
um, compared to, t to, to 90 days, the patient's muscle themselves on average, patients increased 137%, so it's about 1.3 times increase of sialation of their muscle after 90 days. So indicating that the MENAC that they took actually resialated their muscle. Um, so all of this is very important. It's, it's what, what the FDA would like to know. PK, safety, safety long-term, and biochemical effect. But what, what's next? And, and how do we show that it actually helps a patient? Um, so I'm going to leave this to Canon because I think I'm going to run out of time. Um, so we measured in the natural history study and in the um, phase two study a lot of clinical parameters. Uh, strength by quantitative muscle assessment, which you will hear about tomorrow uh, in the meeting. Uh, muscle imaging by MRI. Functional tests, so it's six minute walk test, timed up and go. Other tests, patient reported outcomes. We tested a lot of existing patient reported outcome um, uh, uh, tests and scales, and we're actually trying to develop an, an, another one as well. Uh, so, I'm going to leave this to Canon. Um, so, what is really needed for MANAC approval next? What's next? So, we showed safety, efficacy, preclinical models, biochemical outcome. That is a, a clinical study in a larger population that is double blind, placebo controlled that will demonstrate a superior effect, preferably sig statistically significant, of MANAC over a placebo group. And, and it needs to be demonstrated by a clinical outcome, like strength, or your quality of life improves, or a, another patient-reported outcome Im improves, and that is what the FDA needs to approve such a drug. In addition to all the, the, the parameters that we have already I identified, um, so we designed a multi-center trial for MANAC and GNE myopathy. Uh, we applied all the knowledge and tools that we developed in the previous studies um, that, also, um, uh, ident that also instructed us what would be statistically significant for the number of patients in the trial, a dosing, trial duration, and endpoints. Uh, and in the meantime, we established funding and collaborators. Um, so this trial had, as I said, as a kickoff meeting yesterday. Uh, it will be a multicenter trial of MANAC and GNE &E myopathy. Um, uh, we were funded by a UO1 grant through the, Ni the, the NIAMS Institute. Um, it, was implement it will be implemented through the NIND NINDS Institute funded um, so-called Neuronext Network. It's a network for excellence in neuroscience clinical trials. They have um, run nine clinical trials, multi-center, um, with a central IRB, with a central um, uh, coordinating center, a central pharmacy, and a central data um, processing center for neurological disease only. Uh, the co-PIs on this trial are Dr. Amato at Harvard and Brigham, uh, hospital in, in Boston, and Dr. Carrillo at NIH. Um, and we're very happy to announce that we uh, partnered with, uh, with, a new with a pharmaceutical company taking this, uh, this project on, which is Lydiant. A little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, so this concludes my talk, and this was truly a multi-center um, <laughs> effort already. Um, and very multidisciplinary over the last uh, about 15 years. Uh, NHGRI played a major role. Dr. Gall is the, the IND holder and our clinical director. Uh, Dr. Carrillo, the PI on uh, all the clinical studies. Uh, Kenan, who will speak uh, after me, um, is uh, the trial um, co coordinator. Uh, myself and May Malikden are more the scientists behind uh, uh, all the studies. Uh, NIH Clinical Center played a major role. Tech Transfer Office. Trends helped us really get into our phase one trial. It's a therapeutics for rare and neglected diseases program of NIH. Uh, Barry Consultants helped us with uh, statistical strength 
outcome parameter, New Zealand Pharma for the drug, NDF for some funding, thank you, um, to bridge between a phase two and phase three trial, many um, clinical research organizations, CROs, and uh, I want to emphasize Lydians, um, and um, there's two representatives of Lydian here, Nancy Parson and William Rowe, and Nancy will uh, talk after me uh, to introduce Lydian to you. Um, this is my final slide. So if you have any questions about clinical, contact Dr. Carrillo uh, and Ms. Bradley, who will talk after me. Uh, if you have any research or background questions, my email is here. Uh, you can also do a Google search for NIH and GNE myopathy. You get to this website where all our study um, uh, information is on and contacts as well. Thank you. We have, we have a question over there. Is it a quick question? Okay. So one of your slides you mentioned on average 137% increase. Uh, was so that was an average. What we did is for every patient, we, we got... Um, can, uh, yeah, can you repeat the oh, question? There, the question was uh, the 137% increase in muscle sialation. Was that for every patient? Um, so this was an average. So we, um, uh, we put the baseline at 100% and... Um, the, after 90 days, we, we, in, we measured, uh, or actually the independent researcher uh, identified the percentage of increase, and then we took an average between uh, all patients across the board. So n not every patient increased. And we did not um, uh, go back. We did, but we did not in, uh, include it in, in this evaluation. Uh, some muscle biopsies had a very bad uh, quality. So some patients that did not increase, a few we could point to the quality of the biopsy. Some others we could not find a good reason why they would not respond, but we want to link it to their strength and their change in strength, and that is going on now. We have locked all the databases, uh, as good as locked, uh, the phase two trial, and then an independent biostatistician will compare all the aspects of disease, the PK, the increase in, in sialation, the increase in strength or the, 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 the strength measurements and see per individual um, and, and evaluate this per individual. So I cannot go into the individual increases at this point because it, it needs to be evaluated by an independent researcher rather than by me. Uh, the time frame of the phase two um, data evaluation. Yeah, so we are still, um, uh, it's called monitoring. We do final monitoring of the databases and that will be locked, that will be happening next week, Canon, right? So uh, next week you said, right? Yeah. Two weeks. So in two weeks, the final monitoring of all the databases will occur, and then the databases will be locked. That means we cannot make any changes. No one can, can touch the data anymore, and we have a, a contract by a, by a biostatistic uh, company that will perform independent biostatistic, biostatistics, and uh, that will be performed in about six, a six-week time frame. Um, and Yes, and then we have to report this to the FDA in a clinical study report, and then we can make it public. So we plan, and we're already right, we're planning to write a publication on this that we will um, submit at the same time that we make it, it uh, in a time frame that we make it public to. But a lot of the data I presented already, but it's, it's not correlated per patient, it's just the cohort. 